This week on the Sports Initiative podcast, I sit down with former England and GB Olympic hockey team manager, Andy Halliday. Also a former member of the Metropolitan Police, Andy discusses how his experience in the firearm unit relates to pressurised sporting environments, how to prepare athletes for these types of moments and to provide clear decision making when under duress, as well as his experiences in the Olympic hockey cycles. As always, if you enjoy this podcast, please make sure you share it with friends and family. I hope you enjoy. Perfect. So Andy, I know we caught up a little bit uh, off air there, but it seems like all is well in your world at the moment. Yes. Good morning. And uh, yeah, good to be here. I think, yeah, life's pretty good. I can't, I can't complain. I've, um, I'm, you know, looking back on a, a career, uh, a fantastic career where I think now I'm just starting to move towards pipe and slippers. Uh, not, not completely, but um, able to reflect on, a great deal of experience, I guess, in the world. And and uh, yeah, pr- pretty happy with it. Perfect. And I know I said to you before, but this is, uh, I think, an exciting one for my family because they're all very uh, hockey orientated on my wife's side. So they'll be really interested to hear and get a deep dive into, into your world. But for people that maybe don't know you or don't know your background, do you just want to give us, if possible, a little bit of a whistle-stop tour to I guess your initial career path and what that looked like and then where maybe you've ended up towards the latter latter stages of your career. Yeah, so uh, I I was schooled in the 70s. Um, My my big passion was sport. In the 70s, you couldn't get qualifications for sport. You were, there there was no sort of, if you like, professional um, qualification unless you went to university. So so um, as a result, my schooling was a bit of a disaster in that I learned <laughs> I learned a lot about life. I learned a lot about sport, but but left with minimal qualifications and believe it or not, ended up doing a milk round. Um, so I left school and there I am sitting in my milk float and I hear an advert on Capital Radio and they say, do you want to earn £22 a week and play as much sport as you like? And I thought that sounds fantastic join the Metropolitan Police Cadets. Um, so I thought, well, that sounds like a good idea, but it, it meant that I would uh, move away from home. So I did, uh, thinking that a year later, I'd be back looking for something in sport, something to do. Uh, and rather than staying for a year, I stayed for 31 years. And I look back on a career in the Metropolitan Police, which um, I often describe it as a painful privilege, I think, a heck of a lot that happened through the 80s, 90s, into the noughties uh, that I experienced some of the more iconic events that I was lucky enough um, and unfortunate enough to be part of, I guess, lay the the sort of the, um, the foundations, I guess, for the latter part of my career working in sport and in particularly in international sport. So it, for me, Michael, it was a double whammy in that I I was an international hockey player as a youngster. And again, there was no professional hockey in those days, um, but I was part of international squads. I never really made it top level. I, I played for my country. I captained my country. I never went to an Olympic Games as an athlete. Uh, my turning circle of a North Sea ferry put paid to that so I had it was always speed was always an issue for me Um, just my physical makeup but enjoyed so it it was in balance and in those early years I guess I was really looked after by the Metropolitan Police and they they encouraged sport so I was able to play my hockey I was able to develop my police career and then in the latter part of my career, I worked for 18 years as a specialist firearms officer, which was very much a 24-7 role. You were often on call and hockey had to take a little bit of a back seat. Uh, but then as I approached my retirement age in the Metropolitan Police, having done 30 years, I was I was lucky to effectively be headhunted for the role, the team manager role with England and Great Britain. 
So I've worked for the last three Olympic cycles, uh, preparing our athletes for Olympic Games, Commonwealth Games. Um, and I've recently just stepped away from that. So a, a career in two very different disciplines, but I think that they both probably complement each other. Um, and now I'm out on the Suffolk coast, as I say, first step towards still working three to four days a week with clear track performance, but it's the first step towards just slowing down a little. Well, it sounds like with your turning circle, we've got another thing in common because that was another one of my strengths as well. So yeah, something we've got in common there. Um, as I said, I think a real fascinating story and we'll be able to draw lots of parallels, but also uh, distinguishing factors and whatnot. So I think if we go back to the start, what was that first um, scheme or what did that look like in terms of being able to play hockey to a degree within the Metropolitan Police? And then what did you actually go into from a day-to-day, week-to-week basis within the police? What did you learn? I guess what were what initially opened your eyes when you joined that type of environment from where you have been previously at school? I think I was, I felt very much thrown in at the deep end. Uh, I was 19. I was patrolling the streets of Haringey, Enfield, Tottenham, on my own as a 19-year-old. I'd had a very lucky upbringing, um, a very stable family, a middle class. Um, I really hadn't had to fight my way through my younger years. Um, And I had, up until that point, I guess, really been in my comfort zone. Policing took me straight out of my comfort zone. And I guess that's one of my first real lessons that I still hold today is that you you getting, you've got to get uncomfortable to get good at things. Um, I think it was Abraham Maslow who, a great quote around, you know, you, you, you can either sit back in comfort or you can step forward and learn. And I think step, so the first big lesson for me was, stepping forward and learning and you know as a police officer being put into situations where you are expected to keep the peace make decisions under pressure without a great deal of that sort of background so so for my first few years I was really finding my feet I was making errors that's the other thing that's really important and I guess throughout my career all of us, whether we're in sport, whether we are in, in, in specialist policing, we make errors all the time. It's part of human life. Uh, we have to accept that we make errors um, and learn from them. So I guess getting out of your comfort zone, making errors became almost second nature um, throughout those, those, those early years. So I was I, just developing this, this sort of base of, of, around being quite stoic um, and understanding that, that accepting that sometimes life was not fair, making decisions under pressure, sometimes the wrong decisions, but it was helping me develop as a human being. And how do you manage the, I guess, the risk, particularly in that environment, of making a decision, but then there obviously being potentially some quite high profile or high consequential actions off the back of that because I imagine if you're a new person in that region a uh, new policeman in that re- region and you go in and you look like a rabbit in the headlights that's going to be highlighted to all the people in the area and you know some particular individuals might try and try it on with you a little bit more than they would with the the, the previous person within that region um and also if you start going down the wrong alleyways at the wrong time again you could get yourself into a bit of trouble so how do you start a I guess, assessing risk um, and then making decisions and mistakes that are kind of equitable to not getting yourself in a sticky situation. You you have to accept that you're going to make them. That That's the first thing. Um, it, it's very easy to, I, I think, fallibility and vulnerability are two strengths. So we often see people are very frightened about making mistakes you see it in leadership that actually you know leaders that never turn around and say i've made a mistake you look at certain you know some of our top football managers at the moment jürgen klopp um he would always turn around and say like you know i got that wrong and and in a press conference 
the one way to, if you like, quieten down the, the critique and the flack that's coming towards you is just show a little bit of vulnerability and a bit of fallibility. So I accepted that I was going to make mistakes. I had to be very careful in the scenario that I was I was in. But I actually tended to find that from quite an early age, if you if you if you say, look, you know, I might have got this wrong. Um, it makes a big difference to the sort of reaction that you get. And it tends to maybe calm the vitriol a little. You know, I, th- I can think back to situations in in Tottenham High Road and, and you know, knocking on people's doors. 241, which was my number on my shoulder. You know, can you go around deal with a domestic disturbance? I go around there as a young, pimply 19, 20 year old knock on the door and people would be expecting me to sort the situation out. But actually... I think you've I think you've just got to accept there that that the door opens and there's somebody there who's been married for 20 years. Um, they've probably had a difficult family upbringing. There's a lot going on. And there I am. Um, so you develop a skill in being able to deal with those sorts of situations. And I think if, if when I reflect now on that, um, I often got things wrong. And the other thing was calling for help. I mean, I, you know, actually getting into situations where I think this is a little bit out of my, I'm well out of my comfort zone here. I don't know I have the skills at this point to be able to deal with this, get on the radio, get a bit of help. Um, I remember that, you know, a few of the parent constables, as they used to call them when I, when I started, who, you know, years and years of policing experience. And the culture was very, very different then. But you could always call on them to come and help you um and you then develop so every situation i dealt with added to that little armory that you have of situations and experiences which later on in your police career you subconsciously i think malcolm gladwell calls it thin slicing where he talks about that subconscious mindset that people have they make decisions and they're not quite sure how they've made them but they're based on experience so throughout those first few years I was just layer on layer on layer of getting this experience in the police service which was helping me make the right decisions and the more mature I became the better decisions I made on the front line there and I think one thing that's been highlighted more in in elite sport is around the relationships that athletes try and build with one another or with coaches and I think what's really interesting about the scenario you mentioned there is probably you're going into that environment and trying to make a lot of assessments very quickly um so if you imagine you knock on someone's door like you said you're a 19 year old you might be talking to a 40 year old man or 60 year old woman or whoever and you've got to assess you know maybe what's happened does anyone look distressed what type of um Yeah, when you're going into that environment, what type of little things are you looking for? And is there anything in particular that has stuck with you to help maybe when you're going into an environment like you did in elite sport where you're assessing individuals that are coming into an environment and maybe how they're feeling or if they've had a troublesome morning and you're able to pick up on that a little bit quicker, a little bit easier than others? Yeah, in in those days, we didn't have any sort of profiling or nowadays in professional sport there's you know a lot of profiling profiling certainly with the great britain hockey group we we went through the insights profiling uh in the 2012 cycle and and it's great having that behind you but in those days it you just went on experience and i think police officers often talk about this sixth sense developing the sixth sense and i think coaches are able to do the same the, the longer that they are in the job the the more of a variety of different personalities that they coach the more they understand about the athlete in those days it was I, I i found in sports coaching it was a bit different because i think it was very much about the coach and very much about the manager we've seen this gradual shift towards an, a, a very much an athlete centered environment which has meant that i think coaches have to develop their emotional intelligence skills um Creating psychological safety within within teams, I think, is vital. I think that's a really important part of the armory of, of any coach. In those days, we didn't have it. We didn't have formal qualifications. We learned through experiences. 
you know, I got a lot of stuff wrong. I, I you know, I, I, as I keep saying, you, you make errors. I, I, I did my perception of certain situations probably wasn't brilliant when I started, but then gradually, as I say, you develop the sixth sense. I could nowadays, I think I could walk into a pub and if there was a bit of trouble brewing, I would sense it before everyone else, purely by body language. Um, you, you can just tell by the way that people are uh, talking to each other. You, you pick up an atmosphere. And I, I have been in situations now where I would actually grab hold of my wife and walk away um, because I sense that this this is not great. This doesn't feel right. I think this is going to kick off. Um, and it, but that's something you accrue. I don't think I can put my finger on any sort of incident, particular incident that's contributed to it. But you develop it over time um, because you are taken out of your comfort zone in those in those situations. It's not particularly pleasant, but as I think as I think I mentioned earlier, you've got to get uncomfortable to be able to to learn uh, and develop your those skills, those emotional intelligence skills that that. Um, that, that sit behind all the top level coaches, good emotional intelligence. Is there a particular example that you can think of where, you know, you've been in that environment, like you said, a pub or interaction, and you've made either an observation or a decision thinking this is going to kick off, or I'm a little bit concerned about that individual where you've either got it really, really right or really, really wrong. And what was your review process off the back of, kind of that because I, I guess in, in your role you are making decisions but then you happen to think well actually could I have handled that differently was there something that I missed was there anything that sticks out in your mind as a real learning moment either in a positive or negative context um I think that there was a pub in Tottenham that we used to get called to quite regularly called the Swan um and it was um it was between Seven Sisters tube station and and Tottenham High Road so often on policing football days the swan would be a focus for um football violence in, you know back in, in in the 1980s you're a man after um, my own heart at the minute by the way because i am a tottenham fan so <laughs> I, I, this story might go skew with but the fact there's so many tottenham mentions in this po episode i'm absolutely delighted about <laughs> um well i think i think i th this this particular day that i remember was a um so your, your your rivals from just just down the uh, just down the road. Yeah. So it was a Spurs, it was a Spurs Arsenal game, and I, I I anticipate there was there was some some chanting between a couple of of groups. Ended up they ended up going into the Swan. Certainly one of the groups ended up going into the Swan. I I sort of I, I guess I just got magnetically sucked towards this this incident that was about to occur but missed the fact that West Green Road, which is a, a couple of hundred yards away, there was a major, major disturbance um, brewing down there. And I got sucked into, you know, one situation between just a few people and I didn't see the bigger picture. So I'd, I'd, I'd effectively been, been honed into something that was probably a very small, small incident and missed the fact that just down the road, it, it was majorly kicking off. So I guess that that's one example where I guess develop developing your your peripheral vision in any situation. Um, it, it that that sits out as an example to me where I, I learned from that and I got things wrong and I learned to stand back and look at the bigger picture rather than, you know, just get sucked into something that's that's happening. But again, that's that that sort of sixth sense that you get. You've you know, you think you. Th I think back now to um, my, 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 the work I did in the firearms unit with, um, you know, with the IRA in the 1980s, 1990s. We got involved in a lot of the uh, mainland bombing campaigns as a firearms team. We were working with the counter-terrorist branch looking for or following uh, these groups of individuals. And one of the things that they always used to deploy as 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 a group was they would put a device somewhere but then there would be a secondary device placed at a rendezvous point where they knew police officers emergency service emergency service services were going to gather and that was one so that's a good example of you know 
don't get honed into one situation. Try and stand back and look at the bigger picture. So you're actually thinking in their minds. OK, so if that is the case, where are they? Where are they, they going to put this other device? Where are they going to expect police? Well, there's a there's a big junction there. That's a natural rendezvous point. So we better be a bit switched on and check that. So that, that's that's an example of, 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 I guess, I suppose we're moving away a little bit from emotional intelligence here, but but it's a case of being able to step back in any situation and look at a bigger picture rather than being honed in on, on one individual one individual um, scene. And I, I appreciate it's difficult for us as human beings because we, we our, our focus, you know, if we're told about something, our focus is always on, is always on that, that, that one thing. It's very difficult to develop a peripheral um, approach to things. Um, but looking at the slightly bigger picture, go, I think goes hand in hand with that developing that emotional intelligence as a, as a young police officer. Um, so how do you work around, I guess, not having paralysis by analysis, if you like? Because I'd imagine, you know, you could have that scenario. We go, right, this is where we've been told this bomb or whatever it is. There's five junctions around here that, that they might attack. And then you, you, your indecision could ultimately lead to some challenges, circumstances. And I think this is really equitable to, you know, sporting context where you could be playing an elite team and there's you know you could look at well they can do this and they can do this and they can do this and what what can't they do and actually you try and analyze everything with your team and it almost gets too much to the point where you completely ignore all the things you can do well and how you can affect them so how do you get to that point where okay you're analyzing the situation you're ad- analyzing the scenario and we made a decision, this is what we're going to go all in for. This is what we think is going to happen, or we think this is our best opportunity here. So this is what I'm going to make a decision on, and we're going to do it now. It, there was a great saying that in my 18 years in the firearms unit, no plan survives contact with the enemy. So you can plan, you can plan, you can plan, you can have a an absolutely detailed strategy but actually what happens if you pitch up and the enemy do something completely different because that's what always happens or it starts raining or there is there is there is always something now contingency planning was a strength i think for me um and that's one of the things that i bring into my sport a bit of visualization a bit of thinking ahead what can go wrong the problem is as you say paralysis by analysis you can overplan you can fill your athletes minds full of so much information it will restrict their flow it will restrict their ability to just go out there and play so for us we would look at contingencies but we would not go into too much detail because you have to be able to trust the folk that you're working with to make decisions when things go slightly awry they've got to make their own individual decisions so you know if we look at and and i can i can look at this in in two ways i I can look at an international hockey team on a pitch who are one nil down against australia 10 minutes to go commonwealth games olympic games they're not going to look to the bench for advice they've got to work it out for themselves that's actually really really important they've got to have the ability to make that decision It is exactly the same in policing, particularly firearms policing. You have got to be able to trust the folk that you are working with to be able to deal with contingencies when things happen. So we were involved in an incident uh, some years ago where a a gunman had gone on the rampage in, in West London in Feltham. He had shot at a number of different members of the public. He'd shot at police officers with an AR-15 uh, assault rifle. He'd ended up in an, adre- an, an address in in, uh, in Feltham in West London. Um, he then threw a hand grenade out into the back garden and started shooting at containment units. So we are on route to the front door to deal with this situation. He barricaded the front door. And your, your initial reaction, if you're not prepared for contingencies, would be, okay, so what are we going to do now? And you're standing there. At the, there is no time. And everybody straight away went to the next 
entry point, the next possible entry point, which we covered in the briefing. So if we get balked on the entry on the front, we go straight round to, there's a couple of French windows at the back of the address, and there was the subject, and we, we actually managed to detain the subject. That happened naturally. That's a contingency. It's a contingency that people are trained at that level to be able to simply think, right, make the decision, where's the next place, what's the next thing? And you follow the lead of the person who is at the front. You know, so this is probably not a situation where a supervisor who's at the back is gonna make a decision. We have this situational leadership where people will make decisions. So as far as contingency planning is concerned, you develop a level of skill where people can make the necessary decisions at the right time. If there are certain things that need to be spoken about in briefings and debriefings, and this is the difference I think with, certainly with, with, with policing and high level sport, we brief, we debrief everything. So we go into real, real detail. And that gives the ability of the officer who is carrying the firearm or the, the elite sports person to make those decisions. Um, it's very interesting uh, over the years, I think if you become very, very good at your trade. So I, a good example of this, I think um, I was lucky enough to do an advanced driving course and an anti hijack course with the Metropolitan Police. Um, and it, and it's it's quite fascinating how you develop those those sorts of skills. So they teach you a system, a system of driving um, in the car, which is different to the system that you or I would would use. You know, there's no one hand on the wheel, elbow out the window sort of thing. This is this is a, a proper system where you you double the clutch, double the clutch when you when you change gear. It's it's quite different. But as soon as you master that system. Research tells us that it's easier for us to take in all our surroundings. So with, with, with police driving, they teach you the system and they really flog that system until you've got it absolutely in your sort of memory bank, your muscle memory. Then you start to improve in being able to read the road around you. It's the same in sport, that if you become very, very good with a hockey stick, your, your, those individual skills become very much second nature. It really supports the ability of your decision-making in your periphery. I feel like I'm sort of, I'm lurching from one thing to another to another here, but- um, No, no, it's, it's fine. It's contributed for me. Yeah, no, I think it's really interesting. I said that, that these conversations naturally have a flow to them and it does allow you to, to jump around, etc. I guess th what this question now allows me to come on to is how do you pressurise this? So obviously you're talking about that driving technique or, you know, the firearm stuff in particular, that ultimately is a life or death scenario. So how do you go through in an individual's training where you're pressurising them at a suitable level to get them to feel the adequate amount of nerves or urgency to then make the de decision or go through the process that you've mentioned there. So you've got to try and get as close as you can to the real thing without stepping over that, that line, which makes it so dangerous, it becomes reckless. So for us, when I think back to our specialist firearms training, um, if you were on the range, you were under pressure with time. So, so, and and your marksmanship was always under pressure. So there was a ninety percent um, failure. Anything under ninety percent, because if you think about it, the the the, the, the real the crux of it was be, was being able to shoot um, and being able to shoot under pressure, but also sort of shoot cold. So you'd pitch up at a situation, be confronted by something and have to make a decision. And if you took the shot, your skills had to be right up there. You couldn't miss. You had to be able to um, execute that skill. So the more that you can replicate pressure with, with time on the range, with consequence if you miss. Uh, so, you know, this 90% pass mark if, if you drop below you fail or you you are developed 
um, as an individual you'll develop. So that, that, that's the first thing is creating a bit of consequence, pr creating pressure on the range. Away from the range, um, making the environment as, as close to the real thing as possible. So we would, we had a, a training house where we could fire live ammunition. And it was what was called frangible ammunition. So it, it was, we'd put metal plates, as instructors, we put metal plates up. So this, this round, just like a, a live round, but it would dissipate on. So if it hit the metal plate, it would dissipate. If you shot somebody with it, you would, you would kill them, or certainly there would be really serious injury. And funny enough, probably the closest I came um, to, 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 to being shot was, was in training where um, an officer behind me fired a round that, that, that went over my head uh, and into the ceiling on a training exercise. So I shouldn't laugh at that one, but it's like you've had a 30 year career, quite a lot of it in that. And the closest you come is in yeah. that training environment. It seems counterintuitive to a great degree, but yeah. It, it does, but it, it really, I, I think goes hand in hand with your last question, which is around, you've got to be able to develop an environment where it, it is as close to the real thing as, as you can get it. Now, th those, those sorts of incidents were very, very, very few and far between in a training environment. But the fact that, that somebody is firing past you with live ammunition at a target, so long as it's done safely, it makes things very, very real. And maybe some of the possible shortcuts that you might take if you weren't using real ammunition, you know, sort of poking out from behind the a door or a you know, piece of cover, you wouldn't make those decisions if you knew that live ammunition was being fired. So what that was doing really was replicating what you were likely to face out on the street. And, and it goes back to what I mentioned earlier about the more that you can experience that, the more you'll rely with this sort of subconscious decision-making um, and, and the body adjusts to being in that environment. Um, a lot changed for us uh, following 9-11. So we realised in the policing world that things got very real then in that suddenly suicide terrorism became, you know, this, 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 this is something that, that we're going to see around the world. We'd, we'd, seen it, we'd seen it in Asia. We'd seen it in the Middle East. But 9-11 but uh, really shook everybody up. And I think we expected that we'd see suicide terrorism on the streets of London at some point, but we didn't know when. It happened four or five years later. But again, you know, there is another level that you've got to prepare yourself for because most terrorists up until this point, they see eight armed cops. They put their hands up. They're all pointing guns at, you know, they put their hands up. This was different in that people wanted to go into crowded areas and detonate themselves. Now, if you think about the challenges of that situation and the challenges that, that it presented for us as armed cops were major, major, and loads and loads of discussions would go on. How on earth do you get close to somebody without letting them know that you are a police officer to be able to take, detain somebody who all they actually they want to do is to press a button and detonate themselves. So again, we come back to that contingency planning and thinking through and discussing and talking and trying different tactics out that, that might succeed. But until you are actually faced with the real thing, you really don't know what's going to happen. Now, I've spoken a lot here about, about firearms, policing and the challenges that go with it there is no difference in in high level sport you know you you you, you practice you prepare to face a 442 and suddenly they come out and they're playing a completely different system and you see coaches and managers on the sidelines screaming at you know trying to point people into the right direction i guess in firearms policing what you're trying to create and what you're trying to develop is the ability for the individual to make a decision on the spot, empowering them, uh, giving them the, the, the background, the training, the knowledge, 
the awareness, the confidence to be able to make those decisions. Um, I take quite a lot of that from, from my priest career into my work with um, in high level sport um, and certainly as a coach, developing that decision making for individuals rather than, you know, the, the coach tell situation, making it much more athlete centered so they're able to make the decisions under pressure. Um, I think this is a real nice crossover point, actually, because my next question was going to be around how you create the environment. So, so you, you, you discussed uh, the challenges with that counterterrorism type environment with large crowds, but also the house. And my question was going to be, how do you create an environment that has maybe adequate amount of chaos, if you want to call it that, to suitable amount of challenge and then debrief on that and in, in my opinion in my coaching I think that that's a very similar question to what you get as a coach in sport which is how do I create enough of a game chaotic environment for the person to take on information and get the tactical understanding that we're trying to develop whilst also not overloading them to an stage where they might be trying to develop and learn techniques that they're currently not ready for because they haven't been exposed to the building blocks prior to that so I guess, is, have you got any examples in either, either of those or both of those environments where you're trying to create the environment which is suitable and allows the individual to develop and then debrief accordingly? So I think the first thing is, which comes back to something I said a lot earlier, is that you've got to allow error. So, you, so people do have to be able to work in an environment where they can make mistakes, but it's the training environment because that's, that's how we learn. So that's, that's, that would be the first thing is that, that errors need to be accepted um, because that will help the individual develop. I was lucky enough to work with, with a guy called Danny Kerry, who uh, coached, the, he coached the GB men's group. Um, I worked with him from 2018 through to the Tokyo Olympics. He, he was coaching... 2016 in Rio with the GB women's team who won gold uh, and he had he was able to do that by recreating recreating scenarios with consequence so for for a lot of the preparation time leading up to the Olympics he, he spoke about thinking Thursdays where the athletes would be put under pressure to uh, think through scenarios and would actually play out scenarios on the pitch. So, you know, he, okay, so we're, we're, we are 10 minutes away from the end of the third quarter in a game. We're down to 10 players and Argentina, we are, we are one nil up against Argentina. What are you going to do? And they'd actually go out and play through that, play through that scenario. And he did that every week. And it was a constant theme around planning, looking ahead, planning for what they were likely to face and how they'd react to a point where uh i don't know if you remember that that 2016 where you know the bbc news was stopped because everybody was watching a game of hockey on the television unheard of um and it went to, it went to a penalty shootout um and because of the work that the coaches and danny had done leading up to that point he simply developed this environment where they were back at Bisham Abbey. So they weren't playing in front of 12,000 in Rio and it was the Olympic gold medal and everything was on it. They, it was simply this, we'd gone through this before. Remember what happened back at Bisham Abbey? And I don't know if you remember, but Holly Pern Webb, who's the current captain went up and she scored cool as you like. She, she scored to win Maddie Hinch, goalkeeper had made some fantastic saves but but holly just went through that process that was back at bisham and it was simply all danny did ahead of that was remind the group what they'd done at bisham abbey it, i mean it sounds great it sounds very very simple but it had worked because they'd they'd created this almost like memory bank you know i spoke about that thin slicing that subconscious Part of this was shootout. What are we going to do? And it had been practiced and practiced and practiced at Bisham, and they simply executed what they'd done at Bisham in Rio, which sounds very, very simple, but 
if you work really hard with the athlete group and you get them making those decisions, so you're not telling them what to do, they are working out the solution for themselves so they can actually execute that. Not dissimilar to police firearms work where you expect the individual to make decisions and the right decisions under real sort of pressure. I really like the continuity side of it as well. I think that it, you know it's very easy and I've been guilty of this in the past. You do those scenario games and go, well, you know, I did that for two or three weeks in a row and they, they must understand it now. Whereas actually, if you can give them that bank of, you know, multiple repetitions of it over a prolonged period of time, you can, again, as you said, hand ownership for one, but also it creates a bank for them to recall um, and it allows them to use different strategies. So I, I look at the Euro final of England. It'd be interesting to see whether they did have discussions around if we're one nil up after 20 minutes, what do we do? And was it uh, we're going to carry on high pressing to try and win the ball back or was it a drop in scenario and whether actually they realised that for them as a group, the best chance for them to see this type of fixture out would be dropping in because they've worked on it excessively during training. So I really like the continuity side and being, I guess, so purposeful with it because I think that allows the players to, as you said, make errors in the way that they deal with it so that then when they do make a decision on how they're going to counteract that problem, everyone's all in because they know that we've tried multiple ways and we think this is the best way for us. And I think it's also worth taking a step back from, from that, that environment that you speak of. You, you actually create that environment by developing this athlete-centred culture. And I think, you know, it's one of the things I've, I've, I've had the fortune to do some work with Gareth Southgate over the years. You know, the big thing for me that he changed was he, he went from a quite a dictator, dictatorial 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 um, manager led environment to uh, an athlete centered now you can make the decisions you've, you've got everything up there you can make the decisions and I think that sort of thing doesn't happen overnight so I think I think to get to that point there's a really important sort of culture piece because ultimately I think when I look reflect on my career decision making is, is crucial in any environment, making the right decisions, learning from the wrong decisions that you make. And there's always this gap, isn't there, between stimulus and response. So, so we are stimulated to make a decision and then there is this gap and then there's the response that you get. And we think you know, 95% of our lives is spent making instinctive decisions, 5% is where we actually methodically think things through. But the more that you can fill that gap, the better decisions you make. I go back, I remember probably the very first time I was confronted with an armed situation. Um, and I was, as far as I was an armed response vehicle officer, I was probably a bit wet behind the ears. You know, I just I, I, I learned how to use a gun some years earlier, but I'd only just done my armed response vehicle course. I'm thrown onto the streets of London. I've got all my policing experience backing me up. Uh, but I'm in this very first situation of where, where I've actually had to draw my gun and I'm, I'm confronted with a situation. And again, I, it comes to this stimulus response and what sits in the middle. Um, and there was a, a car, BMW, that had been stolen at gunpoint. And that was all the information we had. Male with a handgun, gun has been, uh, a car has been stolen at gunpoint. Suddenly, there's that car in front of us. So you're going in your mind, you're weighing up, you're thinking about, I'm thinking about all the skills I've accrued as a police officer. But this is really going to be a decision based on the level of force that we're going to use and what decision we're going to make. The car pulls over. There's no chase, but the car just pulls over. Front passenger gets out as I get out. He looks at me and he legs it and off he goes. And so I leg it after him. Now, if you think about the information I have in my head, that car has been stolen. It's been stolen at gunpoint. That's all the information I have. Is he the gunman? Is he not the gunman? He could be carrying a gun. 
So you're trying to process this as you go. And I'm running down the streets of Peckham. I remember where it was. And I have in my head, I've got to make a decision here. And this guy's in front of me. And the chase goes on for about 70 to 100 metres. Wooden fences either side, palleted sort of fences. And he, he sort of slows and he puts his hand onto the lapel of his jacket and his hand goes inside his jacket. And so here, here is my, my uh, this is the stimulus. And there is this, shit, what do I do? <laughs> Apologies for expletive. What do I do? What do I do? Um, his hand comes out of his jacket and a large bag of drugs gets thrown over a fence. 50 yards later, we detain him. He's nicked. Um, but when I look back on that and think about the process around decision making, what was that backed up by? It wasn't really backed up by experience. It was backed up by, by law. It was backed up by whether I could or couldn't pull the trigger. It was backed up by years and years of policing experience. But every situation after that, I had that in my memory bank. And I was convinced that if that had been a gun, I would have been able to react in time if that gun had come out and pointed towards me. So it, it, the decision-making is, is the crux, whether it's in that situation, whether it's uh, on a, an international hockey pitch, a club hockey pitch, it, it makes no difference. And it's about how you fill that gap between stimulus and response um, and you make the right decisions. So years and years later, touch wood, you know, in, in, in all the years I was, you know, I reckon probably between 100 and 150 farms operations every year. And I was in the farms unit for 18 years. I was involved in incidents where shots were fired by us on five occasions. So if you think about that, that's, that's very, very few. But there were quite a few occasions where I was actually pointing guns at people and my finger would go onto the trigger and I'd be going through that decision-making process. Touch wood, I always made the right decision. I'm, I'm still here. So um, it, it, I, found it, I find it fascinating, I really do, how people make decisions under high levels of pressure. And how do you review it? So you, you, you find tooth comb every decision you make, just because you've made the right decision. And I think, again, this is something I've come across in, in business and working with businesses is that they only debrief things when things go wrong. Actually, what you've got to review is every decision you make. So uh, whether it's sitting down as a group and reviewing what's just happened, whether it's an individual running through in your mind and, and, and reviewing it, but if you review everything rather than just saying, well, nothing went wrong. So therefore we just move to the next one uh, because you, you can learn from, you know, this is the reason why sports teams are able to stay at the top of their game because having got there, they review things as if they've lost, you know, so you are, you are always looking to be better as a firearms team. It didn't matter how long we had been on duty. We would always sit down and go through a debrief. Different types of debriefing. If it's been traumatic, it's a defuse. If it's uh, you know a quick tactical debrief, or we would have a long tactical debrief afterwards to improve the way that we work. But there would always be debriefing. And the other thing is, I think the, the officers being put through challenging situations on a judgment range. I think is is critical. Um, you turn up the heat in the range, you've got all your peers sitting around behind you, you've got a screen in front of you, you've got to make a decision. And it's not just about thinking about the decision you make, you're also thinking about the fact all your peers are, are looking at you. There's an instructor standing there staring at you and you've got something that plays out on a screen in front of you. Those sorts of real pressure situations in my development as a police firearms officer uh they contributed a lot a lot 
Um, and, and simple decisions around, so I mentioned that uh, training um, house that, that we used to use, you would, you would have targets that were uh, life-threatening. You would have targets that maybe would uh, or, or demand the use of a taser rather than a lethal firearm. You would have somebody standing there with a camera, not a gun. So loads of, of situations to play through where you're forced to make a decision. Sometimes it is very difficult because, as you know, you can't, your brain can only process at a certain speed. We make our instinctive decisions day in, day out. But that methodical thinking, which is five times slower than our instinctive thinking, if somebody is pointing a gun at you, sometimes it is, it, it is very, very difficult to process in time. So you've got to make some form of decision. Um, and that I think sometimes a lot of people forget when people do make the wrong decision, it's simply because the brain cannot process that information quick enough. Um, and you see that in training. We see that on the sports field as well. Can I ask something around the diffuse debrief? Um, because I, I've got a, a personal view around um, debriefs at the end of fixtures and what, I, I think they should look like, but um, it might link into this. So you mentioned around def diffuse debrief is when it's been a highly volatile situation or highly emotional. What does that actually look like um, for the individuals involved? And what do you actually go through during that, that moment in time? Um, it, has, it has many different guises. Uh, I think there is what we call the hot debrief. So like, at the end of the game, that's literally a hot debrief is either the players getting together or the staff group and the players getting together um, where there is some, there could be some form of psychological pressure or damage. We would then carry out what we would call a defuse or a decompression. And it's, it's, it's not so much around the tactics that we've used. It's the opportunity for the individuals to, to, to vent to open up with their feelings. Um, and again, it, 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 you can only really do it if you've got the right culture. Um, I've been involved over the years in a mechanism called TRIM, which is Trauma Resilience Management. I'm a, a TRIM practitioner. So in, where there has been a traumatic event and traumatic events are very different, what might be a traumatic event to you might not be to me. So. It's around the perception of the individual. So I have learned that in order to help people cope with stressful situations, it doesn't necessarily have to be trauma, but stressful situations, losing a medal match, um, maybe a, a big firearms operation and, and, you know, bad guy gets away. Um, in, in able to, be able to, to enable you to be able to cope with those, you've got to be able to have this decompression or defuse. And it's a chance for everybody to speak up. The role of the coach, the role of the leader in that situation is to ask the right questions. So it's, it's, it's something where it's a facilitation. It's, um, if you like, it's non-directive coaching. So you are asking open questions, tell me more, explain, describe to a group of people to get them to be very open about what's just happened. Now, the, the bigger picture with this around TRIM, the trauma resilience management, is that you have to give people the opportunity to develop this sort of peer-to-peer -peer support tool. Otherwise, if you don't deal with things within four months, it, it will scar you, it will come back to bite you in the backside. So encouraging people to be open the timing of it is, is actually really critical. You can't do it straight after a game. You've got to, you know, if you're away at a tournament, give it a couple of hours. Um, it might be a couple of days later. But again, it, it's another one of the skills of a coach, understanding the culture of the group, when to put a decompression in, when to put a defuse in, and how to run it. 
do you let the senior pros, the leadership group within the team, do you literally stand back and facilitate it and let them run it? Because there might be things that the athletes want to talk about that they won't talk about in front of staff, but they still need to talk about the, those sorts of um, um, subjects. So again, it's, it, it's not one of these things where you can just be really prescriptive and say, right, defuse. Defuse is change. The location could be really important. Um, and certainly if, so the, some of the trauma resilience I've been involved with, we try and take people out of their work environment to carry out the decompression and the defuse, make sure they're not wearing the normal clothes that they would have at work, try and completely divorce it from, from the working environment. Um, it's really important. Sometimes in a multi-sports event, Commonwealth Games, Olympic Games, you need a defuse at certain times within the tournament, knowing that you've got to play again tomorrow. So it, it can be quite challenging, can be quite challenging. Yeah, no, it's really interesting because my personal opinion um, is I think having a, a evaluation straight after a game is the worst possible time because everyone's still, you know, emotional. They still got adrenaline going through their body, and at times it can get accusational. And again, that's probably in the environment I was in at, at different points. So I actually think the ability for people, as you said, to kind of decompress from the emotional side to have a reflective piece to then come back to it. So I really like the fact that, you know, you've mentioned different areas that can go down. It might be a couple of hours after just to allow that drop down if you're in a multi-game tournament or it might be a couple of days if you're, you know, in a situation where you can allow that. So I think that that's a really nice use and, and um, where you can differentiate between when you need it and why uh, within the, the other thing I'd say, Michael, is that um, the old adage, you know, today's news is tomorrow's chip paper. <laughs> it's exactly the same with thoughts at the end of games. You get really emotional. There is so much that goes on. I've, you know, been in environments where athletes of, of, have reacted to defeat in a at the the highest level by 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 leaving the team and walking back to the hotel you know there there the people are so diverse in the way they react that actually if you think well tomorrow morning we've all had a chance to sleep we've all had a chance to think things over things will never be as bad tomorrow morning um so i often th i often think about that and and particularly around my thoughts. So how am I going to be thinking tomorrow morning or if I put myself in the, 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 the shoes of the athlete? Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's the same with shooting. So over the years, the incidents that I've been in, it's, it's accepted that because of the emotional baggage you carry immediately after being involved in a traumatic event, a, you know, high level shooting, not the sort of thing that happens every day. So there is, almost like a 24 hour period where officers whether they are what we call the principal officers who are the ones who pull the trigger on the front line or the officers who are involved in the situation will take a 24 hour breather before they put anything on paper and write any evidence because you, you simply all you're going to recall is 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 very much your tunnel vision of what happened and and the longer so 24 hours later the longer you're able to reflect the more accurate you're going to be able to recall what's happened um it's it, it I, I find it all again you know it's it, it's really interesting how that that thing in there that that that, that uh, the brain that we have in our heads how it reacts to all these different situations and how much control it has over us. Perfect. Listen, we're right at the time we allotted for this. I'm going to ask you one last question, which uh, we've spoken a lot around, I guess, dealing with pressure, decision-making, et cetera. Um, and it might be quite a challenging one with your, your career and a variety of different aspects, but who's the most impressive person you've worked with in this space and why? Um, th there is a guy called 
a guy by the name of Andy McCann, who um, is, is a colleague of mine, somebody I've worked with over the years. Uh, he's worked as the psychologist for the Welsh rugby team. He is somebody who I 100% trust. His, his ability, his emotional intelligence, his, his knowledge, his background knowledge, his perception of many of the subjects that we've spoken about throughout this, this podcast is absolutely right up there. If I had a, a question or a query about anything, it would, he would be the one that I, I, would, I would ask. Um, there's no hidden agenda. There's, uh, he is just an incredibly knowledgeable guy. And I guess over the years when I've had my challenges, he's also somebody who I have would, would go to with, with, with questions, um, seeking support, seeking help. So he would be right up there. Perfect. The Listen, really it. appreciate your time. A, a fascinating conversation. And um, I mean, we, we haven't even talked around some of the hockey stuff, so it might be something that we can catch up again on a later date. But really appreciate your time and catch up with you again soon. No worries. Thank you.